Thank okay. you. Okay. A couple of us have talked about this, and our presentations are that, not that long, so we're not. We're going to kind of cut it short in this one, so you can make it to your next next event. I'm Julie Hammonds, and I'm going to introduce. Who am I introducing? Who are you? <laughs> I know this is Jody, but who are you? Are you Caroline? Yes, you're Caroline. Okay, I'm going to introduce Caroline to you, and. Jody uh, Felmont is going to present her. She was raised in Blanding, Utah, married her Lyman cousin. We all have those in our family, don't we? <laughs> I have a daughter who did a similar thing. Married her Lyman cousin, John. She's a descendant of Caroline Eli Partridge through Walter Clisby, and we heard about him, if you got to hear about him in Leo's uh, a few minutes ago. If you didn't, get to see Leo at some time during the day. She has nine children and seven grandchildren, and she lives in Monticello. So now we are going to hear from Caroline. My name is Caroline. I was the fourth child of Edward and Lydia Partridge, born January 8, 1827, in Painesville, Ohio. My father was well-to-do, and I had a happy childhood. When I was about four years old, my father was baptized, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, by the prophet Joseph Smith. Only two months later, he was called to be the presiding bishop of the church. Family life was never quite the same after that. When I was six, and our family was living in Independence, Missouri, a number of armed men came into our home and violently seized my father, taking him to the public square where he was tarred and feathered. When he came home, I thought he was a fierce Indian and I hid under my bed in fright. When I turned eight, I was baptized into the church by Peter Whitmer. Our family was driven from place to place and persecuted by the mobs. We eventually ended up in Nauvoo, where my father began construction of a house, but his health was broken in consequence of cruel and prolonged persecution. He collapsed and died when I was only 13 years old. At age 17, I became the first plural wife of Apostle Amasa and Mason. Once again, persecution drove us from our homes, and in 1848, accompanied by my sister Eliza, who was also Amos's wife, we crossed the plains to the Great Salt Lake Valley. Also in the company were my mother, my sister Lydia, and my brother. When we got to the Salt Lake Valley, we shared a small hut with seven other people. Eliza and I did. The next spring, my husband was called and went on a mission to California. Eliza and I and her baby moved into our wagon box to live on our own lot. We did what we could to support ourselves and I taught school in Farmington for about two months to help out. In the spring of 1851, my husband left for California the second time, and this time I went with him. I stayed there for two years and then returned to Salt Lake City where I was finally blessed with a child after nine years of marriage. We named our baby daughter Martha Lydia. Three years later, my first son Frederick was born, followed by another daughter Annie in 1860. After my husband returned from serving a mission in England, our family moved to Fillmore. There I was blessed with two more children, Walter Clisby and Harriet Jane. When Harriet was a year old, I separated myself from my husband and found comfort once again in the companionship of my sister Eliza. A few years later, her son Platt was called to Oak Creek to be the bishop of the ward there. 
My sons wanted to go with him to find work, so I went along to keep house for them. I bought a lot, which had a log room with a dirt roof. Eventually, the boys built a two-room adobe addition with an attic, which served well for bedrooms. I had a little heifer there in Oak Creek, and she was not doing so well. I didn't think she'd make it to spring when she could eat the green grass, so I would take a handful each day of straw from the straw tick on my bed to keep her alive until spring. I really enjoyed teaching, and I taught my own children and anyone else who wanted to learn while there. <clears throat> the Relief Society was organized in the Oak Creek Ward, May 3rd, 1874, and I was called to be the president, a position I held for 32 years. <laughs> In May 1881, Harriet and I went to St. George where we met my brother Edward and sister Emily. We spent a week working in the temple there. We did endowment work for our parents. And we had them sell to each other, the three of us, and our dead brother and sister. And it was a very happy time. Over the years, I enjoyed spending time with my family, including my grandchildren. I particularly enjoyed gardening. I loved my flower gardens and planting vegetable gardens and fruit trees. About the last of March, 1893, I received a letter from the First Presidency, which read, Dear Sister, the dedication of the Great Temple in Salt Lake City is an event of unique importance. We desire your presence on that occasion and cordially invite you to attend. We cannot forget the part which your noble husband, now deceased, took in contributing to its erection and the lively interest which he always felt in the progress of the building and its completion. We feel sure that you will appreciate the ceremonies and therefore desire your presence. It will be proper for you to be at the south gate of the temple block between half past eight and half past nine o'clock on Thursday morning, April 6th, 1893. Very respectfully yours, your brethren, Wilford Woodruff, George Q. Cannon, Joseph F. Smith, First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was instructed by the authorities of the church to bear my testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith often, which I did. On my 79th birthday, I wrote in my journal, 79 years have passed almost like a dream and I wonder how many opportunities for doing good to my associates have I neglected. In all the years I have lived, my desires have been to do all the good I could and as little evil as possible. The first part of May, when Caroline Ely Partridge was 81 years and four months old, she contracted pneumonia and passed away on 8th of May, 1908, in the south room of the adobe house which her sons had built for her. President Joseph F. Smith and Apostle Francis M. Lyman were the speakers at her funeral. She was buried in the Oak City Cemetery by the side of her sister Eliza, with whom she had lived with so much in life. In death, they were not parted. I 
am Eliza Mariah Partridge Smith Lyman. I am so happy to see you here in such comfort. There was a time in my life where I didn't think anybody in my family would ever again meet or live in anything but a muddy hut. That wasn't always the case. This was mentioned by my sister. We grew up in a beautiful home. My father was a hatter and he was very uh, successful. We lived right in the middle of town in Painesville, Ohio, and had orchards and fruit trees and flowers. My sister, who later lived in the Lion House, said that she never lived in a nicer house than our childhood home. I, had, I went to good schools and I had every comfort that a child in that time could possibly have. My parents were Campbellites. They were followers of Sidney Rigdon. And when I was 10, some missionaries came into our town. Ziva Peterson, Parley B. Pratt, Peter Whitmer, and Oliver Cowdery. They had a new book. It was called The Book of Mormon. My mother believed them right away, but my father called them imposters and sent them away. He must have had a change of mind, though, because he sent after them, and he bought a book. He wanted to know for himself, though, so he went with Sidney Rigdon to meet the prophet himself in New York and to see if if this religion was really true. Upon meeting my father, the prophet Joseph said, he was a pattern of pi piety and one of the Lord's great men, known by his steadfastness and patient endurance to the end. The prophet was baptized that December. My father was so excited to share the good news of the gospel that he went straight to his family in Massachusetts and shared the book and what he had learned about Mormonism. But they declared him crazy and told him to leave the house and to never come back. He was an upstanding member in our community, so surely he thought when he got home that his neighbors and friends would be interested in what he had to say and at least accept them, accept him. This was not the case. They too declared him crazy and ostracized him. As was mentioned, he became a, the first bishop of the church just two months after he was baptized, and there was no handbook, no training, although he was trained by the prophet and Heavenly Father, but his demands and his, what was expected of him was overwhelming. Because he was the bishop, my father had to leave and go help the saints in Missouri. When he, was, when he left, I was very sick and I was expected to die. My father said goodbye to me, but he did not hesitate to go and do what was asked of him. He never did. When he left, he assumed that he'd be able to come back and settle the affairs, his business and his home and all of his properties. But his church assignments never allowed him to do that. And he had to ask for help in settling, in selling his home and his properties and his business. And he ended up getting pennies on the dollar. My father sent for us that next winter and we were there were five of us, five of us girls. I was the oldest and my mother. We had a miserable ride getting there. We were so excited to see him, but he wasn't there. And we had to rent a room. We rented a room in, in the house that was owned by some people that at the time were trying to get away from slavery. And the only light we had came through the, ch if it could come through the chimney, that's, that's all the light we had. And if we wanted to leave the house, we had to go through their living quarters. We were so excited to see our father and thought surely we would once again have great accommodations. When we got to Independence, at least we had our own little house. It wasn't great, but we were starving. The people here ate only bacon and cornbread. We missed our fruit and our wheat bread. But father started planting trees and making the property nice, and we thought surely this would be the place where we could grow and live the gospel in peace. This is not to be. As my sister mentioned, in July of 1833, those horrible men came and dragged my father into the town square and put tar and then feathers on him, and they weren't going to beat him, except one man with a little shred of decency talked them out of that. And we did think that he was a monster when he came back. My mother just had a baby three weeks earlier, and so the saints came to help picked the tar and feathers off of my father, and it left him sore and bloody. It was the most horrific thing anybody should ever have to experience or even see. 
the mobs were so bad that my father signed an agreement that we saints would leave, that he signed the agreement in the fall that we would leave that coming January, half of us then and half of us in April. But the mobs didn't keep their side of the agreement. And in November, we were chased out into the wind and the ice and the snow and lined up on the banks, unprepared for the what lay ahead of us. I wrote, we slept outdoors with ourselves and all of our belongings, getting soaked through. It was the first, but not the last time that I had to sleep outdoors. We went to Clay County where my father got some house logs and, and got four or five high and stretched a tent over the top and then went back to help the rest of the saints in Missouri. Then he and Brother Carrill bought a home that the two families stayed in for two years in one room with one fire for both heating and cooking. I would think how hard that must have been for my mother. My father was away on a mission at the time. We then went to Caldwell County for more persecutions and finally we got to Nauvoo. It was not beautiful when we got there, but it became beautiful. Before we settled there though, I was sent to um, Lima to teach school to make money for our family. While I was there, I got word that my sister Harriet was dying. I rode through the night and I got there in time to spend a few hours with her before she died. My parents were so distraught, especially my dear father. He had started building a place for us about a mile from the center of town. He had a little shed there and he had decided he did not have the energy to walk back and forth. He would just live in that shed until the house was completed. But before he even moved into that shed, he died 11 days after Harriet leaving us most uncomfortably situated. In my journal I wrote, I was too ill to attend the funeral. My poor father. He was completely worn out from the hardship and fatigue of moving around and exposure caused by our enemies who never slackened their hands. He had been firm and steadfast in his religion and tried to do the very best of his ability to attend to every known duty as bishop of the church. Our house was eventually finished and we moved in for a few years, but then my mother remarried. And so I moved into the home of the prophet Joseph Smith as an employee. There he taught my sister Emily and me about the plan of celestial marriage and we became plural wives. Again from my journal, this was truly a great trial to me, but I had the most implicit confidence in him as a prophet of the Lord and could not but believe his words. Nothing but a firm desire to keep the commandments of the Lord could have induced a girl to marry in that way. I often wonder how it was that a person of my temperament could get along with it and not rebel. But I know it was the Lord who kept me from opposing his plans. Although in my heart, I felt that I could not submit to them. But I did submit and thank Heavenly Father for the care he had over me during these troubled, troubled times. Shortly later, the prophet was martyred, and I became the fourth wife of Anna Salinan. Then in February of 1846, we had to leave Nauvoo. The scene of those first 400 wagons pulling out of our beloved city is such a sad, sad memory for me. The cold, the snow, the ice, the mud that we had to endure. Even just moving a few a mile or two every day was so much work. The mud would come up to our hubcaps and we could barely budge. For months we had no shelter at night except for the thin canopy over our covered wagons if we were fortunate enough to have a cover over our wagons. In the heat of the summer, under the most miserable of circumstances, I gave birth to my first baby in the covered wagon. I named him Don Carlos. I was so happy to have him. But the days were hot and the nights were so chill that I became extremely sick. People who hadn't seen me for a long time didn't even recognize me. I was just a skeleton of my old self. And I lost all of my hair. Oh, I was such a mess. But I was happy to have my baby. After when he was three months old, we finally got to sleep in a house. They had a dirt floor and the roof leaked, but it had walls. Five months after the birth of my son, Don Carlos, my journal entry for December 12, 1846 reads, 
the baby is dead and I mourn his loss. He continued to fail from the time he took sick. My sister Caroline and I sat up every night with him and we tried to save him from death for we could not bear to part with him. But we were powerless. The Lord took him and I will try to re be reconciled and think that it is for the best. He was my greatest comfort and nearly always in my arms. But he is gone and I cannot recall him. So I must prepare to meet him in another and I hope happier world than this. I still have friends who are near and dear to me. If I had not, I should wish to bid this world farewell, for it is full of disappointments and sorrow. But I believe there is a power that watches over us and does all things right. He was buried on the west side of the Missouri River, on the second ridge back, the 11th grave on the second row, being farthest from the river. This will be no guide, as the place cannot be found after a few years. A year later, still in winter quarters, my sister and I built our own home. We had been so uncomfortable, we took the logs off of our home and we got it five or six high, and I built the chimney up to my head before we had to have the brother come in and help finish up. Still no floor, and the roof still leaked, but we were more comfortable. Finally, in the summer of 1848, I was able to join the saints in the valley of the Great Salt Lake, but the journey was not very pleasant as I was expecting my second child. I gave birth again in a wagon on the banks of the Platte River opposite Laramie. I named him Platte D'Alton Lyman. We arrived two months later to our destination. The country was so barren and desolate, I recorded in my journal, that I did not think our enemies need envy us this locality or ever come here to disturb us. Once we got to Salt Lake, we did not settle into a life of ease. Several of us were in one small cabin, and like my sister said, we opted to go out of the fort and to uh, have a, a garden and some room, but again, that meant I lived in a wagon. Brother Lyman had been sent to serve the saints in California and then on a mission to England, leaving us to fend for ourselves as he often had to do. I had been trained as a tailor when I was a young girl, so I would sew to make money, and I would also spin, weave, clean, wash, iron, and take care of children in exchange for food. I joined the rest in 1863, the rest of Brother Lyman's family in Fillmore. By this time, Brother Lyman was very worn out in his service, much like my father had been, and he did not seem very happy. Although he was now physically with us, he did not was not able to really take care of us. A few years later, my dear son Platt was called to go on a mission and while he was gone, I supported myself by teaching school in the old uh, state house in Fillmore. And then I ran the Fillmore Co-op and I made a dollar a day. In addition to my own children who were still at home, I was taking care of the children of my sister Lydia as she had passed away and her children had been left in my care. In February of 1877, the father of my children, Alice Lyman, passed away. As I understood it, he requested that he was buried, not in the robes of the temple, but in a dark suit. I do not pretend to understand what happened to this great man, but seeing him end his mortal life that way broke my heart. When I was young, polygamy had been such a trial for me to marry into, but I never doubted the principle and as I, that, that it came from the Lord, and as I got older, I gained a strong testimony of it. In 1879, I was appointed to be a delegate to attend a meeting at the state capitol to fight against the efforts of the anti-polygamous ladies of Utah. These ladies were going around the country gathering signatures that would try to compel Congress to ban polygamy. I was asked to be a speaker there at the meeting, and here is part of what I said. The polygamous ladies of Utah are the honorable wives of honorable men and have no desire for anyone to interfere in their affairs. We are happy with our husbands and children and do not need the sympathy from the outside world, nor do, we, nor do we thank them for it. It is now about 37 years since the prophet Joseph Smith taught me the principle of celestial marriage. I was then married by that order and have since raised a family of both sons and daughters in what is called polygamy. And I am not afraid to say that it is one of the most pure and holy principles that has ever been revealed to the Latter-day Saints and one that is necessary to our exaltation. 
We are not afraid to compare our children with those born and raised in monogamy. Let us rejoice, my sisters, that we are numbered with the people of God and that we have embraced the celestial order of marriage and happy shall we be in the coming day if we have never spoken lightly of sacred things. I moved back and forth between Fillmore and Elk City for a while. During this time, I lost two precious grandchildren and my dearest, closest daughter, Carly. Her dying wish was that I take care of her son, Joseph Platt, who was just born. I was 58 years old. I was in good health, but I was an older woman. But I fulfilled that wish and did the best I could. For a while, we had to live in the home of women who had just had babies so they could feed the child. And then later, I couldn't support us any other way than by living in homes. When he was a year old, I went to live with my uh, son, who had just moved to San Juan, and um, lived there for a few years. I was very lonely and bluffed. There were so few families, and the men of those families had to go away. We were surrounded by outlaws and harsh elements. Only the hand of the Lord preserved us. The joy in my life was having family around. I had lost so many, and once people moved away, we often didn't see them, or if we did, it would cost so much. It was so um, cumbersome that when my family was around me, I was the happiest. I left San Juan after a few years and returned to Oak City where I bought a land to build a home for Platt, Lyman, and myself. Excuse me, Platt Joseph. But before it could be finished, I died at the age of 66. Still faithful, as always, to the gospel that I knew was true and I loved so dearly. who did not want me to introduce her other than as who she was portraying. I am Julie Hammonds. I'm on the board. They asked me about a year ago as we were planning this if I would find somebody or do something about Lady of Partridge. I told them I'd help them find somebody, but I absolutely would not do it. Uh, I don't want to dress up. I don't want to be something. I can't tie this anyway. This is my apron. I told them I, because I don't want to wear a dress, but I will put shoes on to come. So, Anyway, so here I am, and I'm in a team. They told me two days ago, long story short, that I was going to have to be Lydia. So I am not going to portray Lydia, but they told me I could tell you about Lydia. And so that is what I'm going to do, is tell you about Lydia the best I can. Can you hear me okay if I don't hold the mic? Nod your head, sir, or something. Okay. <laughs> Lydia was the youngest of the Partridge daughters and the third one to marry, Amasa Lyman. She was just barely born when her father joined the church, when her parents joined the church. She was born in 1830, in May of 1830. And so her entire young life was going through all of the things that you just heard that her, her sisters told you about. The persecutions in Missouri, her father being tarred and feathered. She talks about a time when there was a, they moved near Quincy after they had been expelled from <clears throat> the far west area and they had to live in the woods and keep warm by a fire. Their barn was burned. Uh, the persecutions followed him. When they moved to Nauvoo, she got malaria and she had been sick as a child often and she got malaria and I don't really understand malaria too well except my father had malaria and he had medicine that he could take from that and he still suffered from things from malaria the rest of his life. So I'm pretty sure that she suffered from the malaria. She also suffered from dropsy and edema. You know what that is? You can look it up. That's what I had to do. Uh, it's swelling. So it's like, you know, when your joint, your, you swell and your legs swell and your hands swell. And she had a lot of problems with that. She also suffered from, they called it rheumatism. <clears throat> but as I did my research on this, I think it was probably more akin to rheumatoid arthritis. And I did have a bout where I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis like, a hundred, well, 40 years ago when I was 30. And it's very, very painful. And the, the pain moves from joint to joint. And she suffered with this most of her life. I don't know about her case because she did not keep a journal, but often when women have rheumatoid arthritis, it goes into a remission when they're pregnant. So they get relief from that when, they, when they're pregnant. And she did have four children. I come through Edward Leo. <clears throat> 
Uh, but, she, but she and Amos did have four children. She married Amos Salim, and she came across the plains with her mother, stayed very close to her mother after the death of her father, and married Amos when she was 24 years old, but stayed mostly with her sisters and her mother. The family was very scattered. If you follow the travels of Amos, he was gone a lot, and a lot, and then a lot more. And so she was mostly with her sisters and stayed very close to her sisters. She did move to Fillmore, Utah, and is actually the only one of Amos's wives that's buried by him in the Fillmore Cemetery. When you go there, you'll be able to see her grave. <clears throat> her pain with her rheumatism that she had was so severe that the last few years of her life, she had to be, she couldn't really walk anywhere. She had to be carried, and she had to be carried on a sheet because she was so painful that nobody could touch her. I just, you know, knowing what I went through, and I didn't go through nearly what she went through, that was really very, very painful. But she stayed faithful to the church. When Amasa left the church, and you'll hear lots of reasons for that, and there's some really good arguments for a lot of them. I hope you'll, you'll go to some of those uh, experiences here at the, the reunion to kind of find out what was going on with him. But when, she, when he left the church, the Partridge sisters really did not stay with him and they kind of separated themselves from him, but they stayed together as sisters. And Lydia did not keep a journal. If she kept a journal, I don't know where it is. And I'm pretty sure Leo could have found it if there was a journal somewhere, <laughs> but no journal. But I wish she had kept a journal so I know a little bit about her. As I've studied the histories of these Partridge sisters and what the Partridge family went through, I really feel very grateful to them and Lydia is very special to me. Uh, my grandmother was named Lydia after her. Uh, I have a daughter named Lydia who's named after her. And they're all named after Lydia Clisby, who was Lydia Partridge Lyman's mother. So it's kind of a special name in our family. I just want you to know you have a great heritage. If you come through any of these Partridge sisters, if you come through the Lymans, uh, we had an opportunity to go back to Topsfield where the Smiths and the Lymans were back in New Hampshire and in Massachusetts, and these people were patriots. And we have the country that we have today because of the people, because of those people and all that they fought for in the Revolution and War to be able to lay the groundwork so the gospel could be restored. And I'm really grateful to them, and I want you to know that I have a testimony of the work that they did, that it was great work, and I hope that you will go in and study the lives of these sisters. You've had some beautiful presentations on them. I wish I could have done a beautiful presentation. That is not me, but I can tell you about her. Thank you. Thank you.